Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our service. This morning we'll be sharing Holy Communion together in one kind, just with the wafer. It doesn't detract from uh, anything we are saying or doing during this service. Welcome to those of you who are watching the recording uh, at a later time. We're grateful to Liz and to Mark for all their hard work. So welcome to you too. Please do remember to turn off your mobile phones. There's a picture. I'm sure each of us knows what that looks like. It's, um, yeah, they can be a bit of a nuisance, can't they? And as I always say, let's just let that, just turn it off completely so that you can be here fully and completely for this next hour or so. So here we are, we're welcoming you, Jeff and I, to St Paul's and we're going to worship our risen and ascended Lord Jesus. And as we do that, we've got a song to listen to. Take my life and let it be. Thanks, Lynn. words really powerful aren't they and um, our, read, our readings this morning are from the Gospel of Mark and Samuel and I'm going to be thinking a little hopefully we're going to be thinking a little bit about the people that God calls and as he calls us that's our prayer isn't it take my life and let it be consecrated Lord for thee and we join in our worship together. Gather us in, the lost and the lonely, the broken and the breaking, the tired and the aching. 
who long for the nourishment found at your feast. Gather us in, the done and the doubting, the wishing and the wondering, the puzzled and the pondering, who long for the company found at your feast. Gather us in, the proud and the pretentious, the sure and superior, the never inferior, who long for the levelling found at your feast. The bright and the bustling, the stirrers and the shakers, the kind laughter makers, who long for the deeper joys found at your feast. And this final paragraph, we're going to say it all together. So, gather us us in, in, from from corner corner or limelight, from from mansion mansion or campsite, from fears and and obsession, from tears and and depression, from from untold excesses, excesses, from from treasured successes, to to meet, meet, to to eat, to to be given a seat, seat, to be joined to the the vine, to be offered offered new wine, wine, become become like the the least, to be found in the feast. Gather us in. And we carry on saying together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commands and to live in love and peace with all. And so together, Lord our God, in our sin, we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that has gone away early. Have mercy on us, deliver us from judgment, bind up our wounds and revive us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, here we go again. Sorry, good people. Come forth. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that we can be here together today. And we pray now for all that goes on in that room next door, that hearts will be open, ears and eyes and hearts will listen, and that these two young people will really listen to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray that same prayer for each one of us too as we listen to God's word. The reading is taken, as you can see, from 1 Samuel chapter 15. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul 
went up to his home in Gilbea of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Saul, sorry, so Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice the Lord. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. Then he arrived at Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled when they met him. And they asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinab, Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he went for him and had him brought in. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the, the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Two parables from Mark, the parable of the growing seed. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And again he said to them, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth, yet 
When planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Thanks, Jeff. The Gospel of Mark I'm going to start with. And I don't know whether you've actually read the whole Gospel. It's just about that fact it's if even if you only read a couple of verses a day it wouldn't take you very long at all it's the commentators say the bible commentators those wonderful people who help us to study the word they say oh it's a fast gospel to be sure and mark if you're familiar with the gospel uses the word immediately a lot. Actually, it's around 41 times. There's a bit of discrepancy, one or the other, but uh, around 41 times. So scholars of the Bible say that Mark's Gospel is the first one to be written down, and as I've just said, it goes at the rate of knots immediately, immediately, immediately. So as we think about the word immediately, it doesn't always mean, apparently, there's a Greek word, and when it, euthos, and when it's translated immediately, it doesn't always mean just then. It serves just as a pushing forward with great urgency. So the gospel, this gospel also talks about Jesus being the servant saviour who came to serve, not to be served. Maybe think about you, Eileen, and your favourite, your favourite song. This is our God, the servant king, calls us now to follow him. So I think then that the word immediately could emphasise his status as a slave of his father doing his father's will the servant king so here's a man who came to serve but he didn't come to serve as a king did he as we would know a king he came as a king of peace if you look at matthew which matthew's gospel looks at the humanity jesus the man and uh, sorry uh, it's not matthew looks at jesus the king of peace and luke looks at the humanity as we would see him jesus this morning in our reading is likening the kingdom of god all the parables i don't know whether you realize this but all the parables jesus told are all about ordinary everyday things aren't they so that i think he told us parables like that liken them to everyday things so we could if we choose have a piece of heaven a piece of that kingdom that he speaks about what is the kingdom of god like well if we liken it to water and to seeds then we know don't we and so as he tells his everyday stories with everyday things that are around him And so then he can draw on that deeper meaning of what the parables are. You'll know, I know already, that parables are just that earthly story full of everyday things. And yet, as we look deeper into the word, we see that it really does have a heavenly meaning. And we have to search for that meaning for ourselves 
as individuals and as a church. So notice how he draws aside in that last verse of the gospel. He, he brings them together at the end because he wants to share with them what the kingdom of God is really like. So it made me think about how you have to be up close and personal. You have to be right there, be asking the questions. And just because Jesus isn't here in the physical form, then we're nudged by the Holy Spirit, isn't it? We get that jelly in the belly and we're, what does that mean then? What does that mean for me? What is Jesus saying to me? And in the gospel there is, if you have ears to hear. I don't know about you, but it's still a practicing art for me, hearing. Because it's not just about listening to people, is it? That's, you know, on the surface that's really easy to, easy to do. Actually, when we really sit with someone and we really hear what they are saying and we've taken the time, then we're close to that person, aren't we? When we're having a deep conversation with people and we're really, they may be saying one thing, but actually we're really hearing another thing, aren't we? And so it's important as we stay close to our earthly family and friends, then how much more will we need to stay close to Jesus in Bible reading, in Bible study, here on a Sunday morning, chewing it all over, helping it to digest, thinking about, oh, I've not, I've not heard that before. Because it you know, our faith, when it's as tiny as a mustard seed, it's just exactly like that gospel reading. As it grows, you know, first, the, it's like the harvest song, isn't it? You know, first the ear, and first the corn, and then the ear, and it all buds out. And that's what we do. When we've got that deep and meaningful relationship with Jesus, we should be blossoming out. We should, from that tiny mustard seed, that great big bush grows, so that the birds can get their shelter and their food from it. And that's the same as us, isn't it? Gathering together in the shade of the tree to find out the true meaning of what God is saying to each of us and us as a church. We nurture that seed of faith. And if we don't, then we stay in our Sunday school days. So I have lots of conversations with people that tell me, you know, when they used to go to Sunday school. And of course, there's nothing wrong with going to Sunday school. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But if your faith is still firmly planted, if your seed hasn't had any water since you were eight, probably need to take a good look at how far your seed has actually grown. Because it's only as we draw alongside the Bible, the scriptures, and take that conversation with Jesus, get that mustard seed, water it with scripture, water it with Bible study, water it with people of like mind that you can toss and turn that over with so actually when your cedars had some TLC some tender loving care it will come out and it will grow that's how we find a piece of heaven here on earth it's just my personal view and then we share that piece of heaven with other people because when we've got some good news we want to share it, don't we? All good news. We want to share it. So we, the good news of Jesus should be top of our list. So we love what Jesus has done in our life. I love what Jesus has done in my life. It's just blown me away. It's like, it's like those uh, ears of corn that get scattered all over everywhere. It's amazing. Because I try 
to stay close. I try to read the scriptures. I try to say, what are you saying to me through that piece, that, that verse, that one verse or that, that couple of verses? What does that mean for me? Now, to do that, we need to take time. We can't just go... Blah, 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 blah. I think, right, that's it, I've done, yeah, I've done that. Wendy says, read two verses of you, Mark's Gospel. Yes, Wendy, I've done that. Stick with the two verses. Ponder the two verses. There's another line from a hymn coming. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. That was one of the first hymns that I actually um, wrote down in my little, uh, because my seed was planted at eight, and if you don't water it, because I didn't, if you don't water it till you're 32, it can't grow, can it? So for 16 years there it was lying dormant, and I had a little bit of growth there and a little bit of growth there, where my babies were baptised, here, there, there. But it wasn't consistent enough to help my seed to blossom and to bloom. So it's in those quiet moments when jesus draws his disciples aside when jesus drew aside to be with his father if jesus needs to draw aside then surely that's even more important for us but he knew the importance of being alone now that could be in your garden that could be on a walk that could be a specific time somewhere you have to choose how you are going to grow your seed, but grow it you must. Or she'll have 16 years of a dormant nothing. Or maybe many more. I'm speaking from my own personal experience. So we all need those quiet moments. We need to open, as I opened for the young people there and Rod and Margaret, we need to open the eyes and the ears of our heart. I did a little, um, a, a little talk at the Deaf Club, and I talked from Isaiah 55, and I was doing all this business in true Wendy style, you know. Oh, um, God says, incline your ear to me. Incline your ear, and I did all that. And one lady came up, just a five-minute reflection afterwards. And she was, you know, quite, she, she said, what are you saying? What are you saying about um, open our ears, incline your ear? We have no hearing. How can we hear? And so I sat down with her and I said, it's here. It's here. God wants our hearts. He wants us to give him our hearts. And we open the eyes and the ears of our hearts. That's what Isaiah was talking about. That's what Jesus talks about. If you have ears to hear, yes, we know that we need these, but actually it's the difference it makes here. It's the difference of whether you have a smiley face or a cheeky one. I know Hyacinth took a cheeky one. But, you know, we have to work on our smiley faces and all the stuff that we have to, you know, all the weeds that we keep having to pull out. Sometimes you don't even recognise a weed, do you? You think it's a flower and so it sits alongside. And then all of a sudden you have this revelation, this light, the light goes on and you think, hmm, that's a bit of a distraction. Maybe I need to pull that out, but we won't know about those things until whatever they are for you. What keeps you from those quiet moments? What keeps you that you, you haven't got time, I'm too busy, I'm too this, I'm too that? Believe me, me whatever sentence you have got, I have got one. I have said it. I have been it. I have done it. Spiritual growth is up to the eyes and ears of our heart. So spiritual growth is slow. Sometimes we can have little spurts that encourage us on our way and we go, oh, 
look how that's grown. How lovely. But actually, it's a slow process to get things to come to blossom. And God is interested in how our heart soil is. So as we read and as we share and as we do all the things together that we do as Christians, it's the tilling of our heart soil. And it's absolutely vital that it keeps getting tilled, it keeps getting turned over. We all know how hard it is to dig into solid ground. Um, so spiritual growth. God's interested in our hearts. Look at the kerfuffle that was going on in our Samuel reading. It did make me smile. And, and to, if you read it, I'm going to read the last uh, part of uh, the reading to you from the message version. So the message version of the Bible, because I thought it, it sort of, um, what do you call it, dovetailed in nicely to the Mark reading, because in the, in the message version of the same, uh, the, the same reading, it says, Samuel left immediately for Ramah, his flask filled with the anointing oil as God had commanded him to do. He's on his way to see Jesse in Bethlehem, and he's off to anoint Jesse's son, one of Jesse's sons. No one could have guessed ever in a million years that it was going to be David, the shepherd boy. No one. Gave me goosebumps on my neck. No one could have foreseen that. Even Jesse was like, really? And can you imagine David being in the field, youngest one, you know, lolling, probably not lolling about, but you know, and then here he is, comes in front, right past all his brothers, who were tall and handsome, and he's not quite so tall, is he? And maybe he was still handsome, it says so. But God isn't interested in this. And we all want to look, don't we, and dress like we're together, and no one, as you know, more than me. You know, this is great. This, if this is how you want to come to church, that's brilliant. But it's all about how are you dressing your heart. So there's Jesse, wheeling out these appropriate sons. Samuel claps eyes on Eliab and is convinced that there he is, God's anointed one. But God told Samuel, no, it's not that one. Then Abinadab and Shammah, in fact, as we heard, seven sons who were thought to be worthy of kingship. And God says, no, not that one, that one, that one. And us too are that one. Us too are that one. Because sometimes we feel small. Sometimes people make us feel small. Sometimes people make us feel insignificant. Sometimes we make ourselves feel insignificant. And actually, if God has chosen us, because that's what we're told in Scripture, if God has chosen us, if God is for us, who can be against us? David fought a giant, he can help us to fight our giants too. When they seem tall and overwhelming, whatever those situations are, he says, trust in me. Listen to what I'm telling you. More importantly, hear what I'm telling you. You are chosen, you are worthy. And that's not just for the Davids, and the souls, and all those other people, that's for each and every one of us. We're all worthy. So I would have loved if someone had put, <coughs> excuse me, David's 
response. Because he probably would have said something like, are you kidding me? Really? You mean me? And maybe other things that we could share. Samuel only got it right for David because he was hearing God's voice speak to his heart. He could have gone off on his own and he could have said, yeah, that one, we'll have that one. But because he was in tune with God, he knew, he knew not that one, not that one, not that one, and not that one, seven times. Some people, uh, as, I, as I've read around this reading, some commentators say that um, it's like when you're in tune with God, some commentators talked about uh, it's like being in an orchestra or it's like being in a choir. And when you're part of something like that, you have to really listen and hear the tunes, don't you? What you're going to sing and what you're going to play. Reminded me of you, Lynn. And, and so when you're, you know, when Lynn's here and she plays with Chris and Sue, when she plays with Ray, you know, they're listening out for each other because they want to get it right, don't they? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to be in that place where we're prompted. We're prompted by God. We're listening to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we will cry, you can't possibly mean me. But actually, God does mean you. He does mean me, and he does mean you. To actually be part of God's family, because God tells us we're adopted into his family, so that, of course, makes us uh, brothers and sisters of Jesus, doesn't it? Now, back in Jesus' day, your genealogy, your lineage, your family tree was really important and people could, you know, tell it, tell it, tell it. And it was really important. Now, if you look in Matthew's Gospel for the genealogy and then Luke's Gospel for the genealogy, you will see that it's, it, they're slightly different. And again, people who study the Bible say, one is from Joseph's line and one is from Mary's line. Have you been in that situation with family members when you're trying to trace your, your ancestors, you know, from way back? It can be quite confusing. But, <coughs> excuse me. In Jesus' time, your lineage was central to who you are. It was in your identity. And we all need that sense of identity. We all need to know where we belong. So if you choose to be part of Jesus' family tree, right, way back, you know, he's, he's part of where David comes in. He's part of that lineage. We too can be part of that family we can be God's adopted children, brothers and sisters in Jesus. Heart to heart. Because when we live a life that's heartfelt for Jesus, then, as I've said, our hearts, the ears and the eyes of our hearts are open. Just as the disciples drew close, to find the hidden truths, we too must be prepared to till that soil and find out what God's got in store for each of us and as a church. Tough in the light of this last year. We're going to do it though, because we're going to trust God and we're going to have faith. And sometimes that faith might be as big as a tiny mustard seed, but we're still going to keep going and we're still going to carry on. I'm going to leave you with 
a couple of verses at the beginning of Psalm 78, and it's from the Message Version. This will be my prayer to end. Listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I tell you. I'm chewing on the morsel of a proverb. I'll let you in on the sweet old truths. Stories we heard from our fathers, counsel we learned at our mother's knee. And we're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing it along to the next generation. God's fame and fortune and all the marvellous things that he has done. Amen. Oh, over to you, Jeff. If you can see the screen clearly then, let's say together the collect, which I think is quite appropriate for the third Sunday of Trinity. Together. God, our Saviour, look on this wounded world in pity and in power. Hold us fast to your promises of peace, won for us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, our prayers. Holy Spirit, you challenge us to live our lives in your truth and your love. In this time of worship, in the stillness of this place, Touch our hearts with your bright fire. But Lord, there are hidden corners in our hearts that we want to keep hidden. The resentments, the hurts, the fears, the, that's my bit, don't look. But Father, In your presence, we're defenceless, exposed as if we were in the bath. And yet, you tell us if you want to wear your new clothes, the old must be abandoned. So this morning, wash us, dress us, so that we can be fit to sit at your table. Father, washed and dressed, we thank you for spring, for may blossom, for daisies, for buttercups, and all manner of wild flowers, for growth that is appearing from everywhere, sometimes where we don't want it, but on the whole, Lord, we thank you for, for the beauty of, of new life for the spring of grass under our feet. And Father, we pray this morning for children, for schools, for playing in the park in little knots of teenagers, enjoying the precious company of friendship. But we also know of the undercurrent of bullying and abuse. And Father, this morning we pray for our schools, for those teachers who are sensitive to situations, and we pray for those who just feel that they're there to teach and that's it. We pray, Lord, for those who have 
a sensitive ear, a willingness to listen, a knowledge of where to direct a child or who to speak to for the safety and the well-being of that child. And Father, we pray for those who in the last year, the last 18 months or so, have been experiencing a life-changing experience of being shut in, of not meeting with friends, not meeting with family, not being supported by those things that you, we didn't realise were so important. The cheery good morning. And we pray for those who may not be able to return to the life they once enjoyed because of age, because of anxiety or of life-changing circumstances. And so, in the silence of this place, for a moment, remember those who are important to you, who you are concerned for, who give you pleasure, who give you pain, for the face you haven't seen for weeks and weeks and weeks because they live many miles away. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And again, because I think it's so appropriate, the collect for today. God, our Saviour, look on this wounded world in pity and in power. Hold us fast in your promises of the peace won for us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're at that part in our service now where we would uh, ordinarily, we would go around and we would hug and kiss and ask people how they were and that's not appropriate is it at the moment so as i say these words the peace of the lord be always with you i'm going to say them in a minute properly and you're going to respond to me can you give everyone beside you in front of you behind you just and also with you and give them a wave okay that goes for you too uh, whoever's at home with you or wherever you're watching this recording, turn to the person who is next to you. Or you might want to pause and think about God's peace for someone that you know. So, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And then we say, and also with you to everyone. Bob, if you were deaf, you see, this is how you would clap, because there's no point in a deaf person clapping together, so we'll wave our arms at each other, and it'll be a rousing clap for each other as well. So, we come to our communion, the meal that we share together as we remember what happened on the night of the Last Supper. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always right to give you thanks, God our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You made, us the, and the, you made us and the whole universe and filled your world with life. You sent your Son to live among us, 
Jesus, our Saviour, Mary's child, he suffered on the cross. He died to save us from our sins. He rose in glory from the dead. You send your spirit to bring new life to this place and to the world. And you clothe us with power from on high. And so we join the angels to celebrate and say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Father, on the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took the bread and he thanked you. He broke it and he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine, he thanked you and gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember me. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember his death and resurrection, Send your Holy Spirit that we who share these gifts may be fed by Christ's body and his blood. Pour your Spirit on us that we may love one another, work for the healing of the earth, and share the good news of Jesus as we await his coming in glory. And together we say, for honour and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. And being made one by the power of the Spirit, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please do pause your recording if you are watching at home. Go and find some bread, some wine, a biscuit and some juice symbols that will help you to join in this very special meal as we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Please do draw near. We are asking that people come from the back, come forward, I'll be to the side here, and uh, you'll t take the bread, and then please go round here. Dorothy's not here, she's on holiday. She go round to my left your right please and back to your seats so from the back
you, Lynn. As I've said before, we can really hear those words, can't we, as we just watch the words this morning and think about, um, oh, I know that one, and I've heard that one, and then when they're on the screen, they give us a whole new feel, don't they? Let's thank God for the meal that we have shared together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. I've chosen this next song. I think that pouring out the oil of love is available for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lynn. involved with the words like I'm really sorry I forgot to move the words on so I do apologize hope you got there in the end thanks Lynn I've got uh, bands of marriage notice between Adam Wayne Middleton and Carmel Murray both single both of this parish and this is for the second time of asking and if you any of you know why these two named people should not be joined together in marriage then you are to declare it now they were here last week so they probably think that's all right then that's all well and done and dusted and this is for the second time of asking Any other notices that I need to be aware of? We ask for God's blessing upon us as we leave this place in all that we are going to be and do this week. 
And now the peace of God, which passes all our understanding. Keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Now, filled with the Spirit's power, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. God bless you, good people. I'm dashing off onto the next thing. Um, stay safe, stay well. God bless. <laughs>